Hi everyone and welcome to a new series on my channel called Story Scoop where I essentially analyze excerpts of my favorite pieces of writing and tell you why I personally think they're effective. Today's episode is going to be on what makes a strong short story opening in my opinion of course. And before we get into the video, I just wanted to mention if you like how I line edit, if you like how I give comments in Word, and you would like some of your own writing critiqued, I'm still raising money to help contribute more my family bulldog Winston. Uh, he recently got a surgery and just trying to contribute to the fund. So if anyone would like a critique, it's pay what you can for three pages of prose or poetry. So check out the link in the description where there's more info on how you can do that. You do need PayPal to do it. So for those who don't, thank you for watching this video because that helps too. All right, so we're in Word as always, and you're currently looking at an excerpt of Slingshot by Suvankam Tamavangsa, which is my favorite short story. This is the first page formatted with German point twelve double spaced. So of course that's gonna vary, but I thought it would be great to show you why I really think the first page of this short story is effective. All right, so let's read the story opening first and then we'll go through the comments, which you can see on the right-hand side of the page. Slingshot by Suvankam Tamavangsa. I was 70 when I met Richard. He was 32. He told me he was a young man, and I didn't respond to that because I really didn't know what that was to be a young man, if that was a good thing to be or a bad one. He'd moved in next door to us, me and Rose, my granddaughter, in January. She was hardly home that summer. She had gotten together with a new guy and was mostly at his place across town. All my friends were in assisted living, but I wasn't. We didn't have the money, and besides, I didn't care much about going. I didn't want to be around people I didn't know. Richard had parties at his place every Saturday. At first, it was just the house warming, and then it was other things. His apartment was an open door, people coming in and out at all hours. Sometimes there were just kids, little ones, over there with Christmas lights all over the floor. Other times it was middle-aged people crawling through some tent maze built out of cardboard boxes. He even had a party where people brought over their bikes, and we took a tour of the city with him. I did not have a bike, so he let me ride with him. I sat on the bar in front of the seat and he pedaled. He told us stories, personal ones, about his time living here. He'd been in the city for a few years. On the bike tour, he told us about a woman he'd loved once, his roommate, where they ate in the city and skipped out on a bill, the places they kissed. The city became his with those stories. When I walked by that building, that corner, his stories were there, the way he told them. There's no such thing as love. It's a construct, Richard told me one day when I went over to his apartment. I had gotten a package of his in my mail. You know anyone who is in love? I thought of Rose, who always said she was in love whenever she met a new guy, and then would wait by the phone all day crying. Then I thought of my friends and my own experience. We had all known it, but it was something that happened a long time ago, not something we sat around thinking about. It happened, and when it happened, there is no need to think too hard about it. So that is an excerpt of Slingshot by Suvankum Tamavangsa that was published in Harper's and of course appears in Suvankum's collection, How to Pronounce Knife. All the details will be linked in the description, including content warnings, because this story does deal with some adult content. Let's jump into my thoughts on why I love this opening so much and basically why this story is my favorite story. Number one, let's take a look at the first sentence. So I was 70 when I met Richard. So we're going to be focusing on the comment I've highlighted. So of course, I said this was a fantastic opening line and it makes me want to know why that age, 70 years old, is relevant to meeting Richard. So it's interesting that Sue Vancom starts with, I was 70 when I met Richard. Immediately as a reader, I want to know why that's relevant to meeting this person. Um, why does age matter in the story? Is age going to be a theme? That's sort of what's drawing me in immediately. 
So now let's take a look at what I said about the next line. He told me he was a young man and I didn't respond to that because I really didn't know what that was to be a young man, if that was a good thing to be or a bad one. In my comment, I said that this is a strong indication of voice, both the narrator and Richard. So for Richard to tell someone on behalf of himself that he's a young man indicates his strong, bashful confidence. Like he doesn't care uh, what other people think about him. He is just stating the facts of who he believes himself to be. The narrator's silence because she doesn't know what a young man is speaks to her character and makes me immediately curious. Is that because she's never seen a young man? Is that because it's been so long that she's been with or seen a young man or been young herself? Um, so this is fodder that I like to refer to as a lasso. So essentially, uh, here, Sue Van Come lassos around the reader's attention and ever so slightly tugs us into the story because this is bringing up a larger conflict. And it's just a very simple sentence. He told me he was a young man. That's just a fact. And I didn't respond to that because I really didn't know what that was. I think that is pointing to, I really didn't know what that was. That line points to something deeper in terms of theme. I think it's really clever how it's placed there because it's not flashy. The language is simple. It's not super poetic. It's not calling much attention to itself, but still there's some power in that line. And it makes me wonder what is a young man to this narrator? So lots of questions uh, that are making me curious. Like I said, that lasso, they're tugging me into the story, which I think is what a great opening for a short story does. So let's take a look at the next line I highlighted. He'd moved in next door to us, me and Rose, my granddaughter, in January. So I like this line because it concisely conveys necessary exposition without disrupting the natural flow of the paragraph. So we do get to know who this narrator is. So clearly they have a grandchild, they're a grandmother, and Richard's her neighbor. So Sue Vancom is very easily, simply, sprinkling exposition in just one sentence. We learn so much um, in, in this paragraph. So Richard moved in next to them. So he's the neighbor. Rose is her granddaughter. So she's a grandmother and Richard moved next to them in January. So you can assume that it was sometime that year uh, because of the way it's phrased. This must be a recent neighbor. And this is also making me wonder, so why is his presence so captivating, which of course we we learn throughout the rest of the story, but that's a wonderful way to, to intro us into some of the kind of nitty gritty factual details uh, of the world that are kind of difficult to often employ in short fiction because writers can often make it like clunky. It's difficult. I do it all the time. I'm like, how do I explain how my world works or who this character is or the situation without seeming too obvious that I am? And this is a great example of how exposition doesn't have to feel heavy. Exposition can be exciting and it can almost be sort of invisible um, in ways. So the next line that I highlighted is, all my friends were in assisted living, but I wasn't. So in my comment, I said, another detail here that tugs me further into the story. So the narrator tells us why she isn't in assisted living. She doesn't have money, doesn't want to be around people she doesn't know. And we get that sort of later in the next sentence. That makes me further wonder, what does that mean for the story's conflict? What does the narrator not being in assisted living mean to her? This is kind of another like lasso moment. So we might find out later and I want to keep reading just in case we do. So the next sentence that I highlighted is, I didn't want to be around people I didn't know. And my comment reads, the last line of paragraph one is almost always integral to creating the most critical point of momentum in the story. For me, and how I also read when I'm reading Slush Pile for magazines, this is kind of the moment when a reader decides whether they'll keep on going or not. Um, so if that line fails, a reader may not continue. And I say that because the first paragraph of a short story can often be like its own little contained story. It's a it's a jumping off point. It should successfully tug a reader in. You know, we've been lassoing them with these details, with this 
information, uh, the concept, the characters. Um, and now by this point, I want to have sort of pulled them in a little bit. So I continued toward the end of my comment and I said, the last line of paragraph one should be a gate that opens the rest of the story so that a reader has no choice to walk through because they are so entranced. That's personally for me when I'm reading short fiction, it's always that first paragraph. It's always oh, um, is this making me want to continue? Is this making me curious? Um, almost always, that's how I know whether or not I'm going to love a short story. So the next line that I highlighted is Richard had parties at his place every Saturday. So as my comment says, this is a new interesting detail and it makes me wonder what these parties entail and why Richard hosts them. So parties are generally a point of energy and that makes me curious as to what energy Richard brings, especially knowing he befriends a 70 year old, which is the information that we're given um, in the first paragraph. I wonder if parties are going to be an important part of this story, if the narrator and Richard are going to connect at a party. These are more questions, more sort of tugging slightly into the story. So the next line I highlighted was, his apartment was an open door, people coming in and out at all hours. So for me, this line is characterization of both character and setting. So someone with an open door policy is sociable, extroverted and lively. I, I would hope so. Um, so an apartment with people coming in and out is intrinsically energetic. So I can see that already that Richard's disposition mimics the atmosphere of his apartment and vice versa. And I think this is also a very clever technique that Suvan Kum is using here, uh, using the setting to mimic the character, using the character to mimic the setting. And through that, getting the reader to understand both at the same time. It's extremely efficient and something that I think in general, Suvan Kam Tamavangsa does fantastically in all of her work. It's brevity. And um, I think this is a great moment that less can be more in, in short stories because in just one line, we already know so much about Richard and we already know so much about his house. And to do that in just a couple of words, like how many words is this? 14 words to do that. That is an accomplishment. That is extreme skill right there. So the next line is, sometimes there were just kids, little ones over there with Christmas lights all over the floor. I noted in my comment that this is a compelling image. The Christmas lights kind of scrambled on the ground. So it's another tug of the lasso further into the story for me. And it's because I'm wondering, why these images? I don't want that answered, of course, not yet because we're still on the first page. We haven't even really made it halfway through the first page. We don't need them to be answered initially because the specificity allows the detail to explain itself or be interpreted. But I do want to see what else Tamafonsa will use to characterize Richard and his parties. So we're already seeing Christmas lights. It's already giving a sort of vibe uh, to his parties. I kind of want to see more about his parties. It's making me interested. Something I didn't note in the comment was the phrasing of this sentence is fantastic. Sometimes there were just kids, little ones over there with Christmas lights all over the floor. The injection of over there brings an immediacy to the sentence, which it's so interesting because this is narrative summary. Like this is not seen over there, sort of like a very um, active phrase. Like, oh, it's over there, somebody would say, sort of in the present moment. You immediately are brought into a scene. Again, in just two words with this phrase over there, Tamvaksa brings us into the scene. And it's, 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 it's fascinating. The ability to wield the energy and equivalence essentially of a scene in just two words uh, is, is fascinating and incredible work. So the next line I noted was middle-aged people crawling through some tent maze built out of cardboard boxes. So this is another image that's, it's a little bit bizarre. So, you know, the over there in this line here, uh, little ones over there, over there is a little bit bizarre. That's not usually where you see this phrase. Um, but then we get even more kind of a, a strange vibe from this image of middle-aged people crawling through cardboard box mazes. Like, did Richard make these mazes for the middle-aged people? Were they there for the kids? So many questions are already creating 
are already making me very curious to to read on. But there's definitely something going on here that I want to investigate. So in my comment, I said, there's a bizarre image here as well. Another tug of the lasso. I'm enraptured by the strangeness and I want to keep reading. Who is this Richard who has cardboard boxes? Like, and how large are those cardboard boxes? Like, where is he getting these? You know, Um, it makes me really interested in his character and also this 70-year-old woman who's at these parties. So the next line that I highlighted is, I did not have a bike, so he let me ride with him. I sat on the bar in front of the seat and he- So for me, this is a moment of turning detail. It signals something to me as I read. He let me ride with him as a quote. Um, This is a very intimate image. Um, We're not sure of what yet though. Um, Are are they friends? Uh, Are they lovers? Are are they something happening? I don't know, Um, but I wanna see where it'll go. So also the image itself is extremely strong. An older woman on the handlebars of a bike is not what we usually see. We imagine that with children or teenagers, we don't imagine that image with a senior citizen. Um, And again, punching in those kind of slightly almost uncanny valley images to really tug us further into the world of Richard and the narrator. So the next line I highlighted is he told us stories, personal ones, about his time living here. And I think this shows more details that tell me who Richard is. He told us stories, personal ones. It's not just stories about something. It's not other people's stories. It's his stories and their personal stories um, about his time in the city. So it's interesting that Richard chooses to announce kind of his personal business at parties. It makes me wonder, is he just kind of a person who doesn't mind sharing? A lot of characterizing detail here. Again, it's such a succinct space. I'm telling you, this is why this short story collection changed my writing because wow, 11 words can do so much. So the next phrase is, the city became his with those stories. When I walked by that building, that corner, his stories were there the way he told them. So the final line of paragraph two, remember I'm looking at this very micro. So we looked at the final line of paragraph one. So what's the final line of paragraph two? And it's this one. So the final line of paragraph two indicates something new to a reader, how the narrator's life begins to intersect with Richard's. So the city is Richard's because of his stories and the narrator now sees it that way. So what I mean by that is she doesn't see it as her city when she's walked by that building or that corner. She only sees him. So this reveals psyche. So think of where you're from. So where you're from, um, or I'll just use myself as an example. And when I think of Toronto, when I think of the streets that I grew up in, I don't think of them as like somebody else's. I don't think of somebody else's stories. I think uh, kind of of my connections, of course, unless I was a part of somebody else's stories, but to solely associate uh, a building, a corner with somebody else immediately says something about this narrator. Clearly she's being affected by, by Richard in one way or another. So the next line that I highlighted is there's no such thing as love. It's a construct. So this is another moment of revealing details here, but for Richard, um, so he doesn't believe in love, but he seems like such a romantic person. So he's riding bikes in the city, telling stories about the woman he once loved and so on, um, and hosting parties. There's a sort of, there's an air of romanticism to how he constructs his life, kind of how we would assume like people in movies live. Um, And now I want to know why he believes that there's no such thing as love. So the phrase, it's a construct, reveals an anti-establishment sort of attitude that we haven't yet seen from Richard. Um, And I wonder if it's going to appear again, his sort of proclivity for going against the norms, going against the status quo. I wonder if that's going to show up again. So the next comment is this one here, and I'll just highlight it. We had all known it, but it was something that happened a long time ago, not something we sat around thinking about. And it is referring to love. We had all known love. So in my comment, I said, could this be a thematic tug? We had all known it, love, but it was something that happened a long time ago. It wasn't something that now we think about. It's something foreign, something far away from us that we once had, but now we don't. 
fact, I'm wondering uh, if Tamawangza has circled this line for us almost, you know, imagine um, with a pen, it's it's underlined for us and is, is giving the loose end for us to hold and follow. I think this might be the line. I don't know. I think just from the way it's phrased, it was something that happened a long time ago, not something we sat around thinking about. This seems like such a profound realization to sort of appear on page one of a short story that it, it's it's making me wonder why it's there. And it's not like it's it's loud. Again, like I mentioned about the previous details, it's not like Tama Wangsa is very clearly uh, in the corner being like, so this is the theme. So the theme was that we had all known it, <laughs> but it was something that happened a long time. No, no, no. It's just very subtly painted into the, the very end of this unassuming kind of sentence. Um, you know, this is just a, a, a narrator, like they're thinking of her friends and her own experience. Um, she's not thinking about something in the moment, knowing that this is like something that means a lot to her or something she struggled with. She's just stating in it. It's very quiet and I think this is such an effective place to sort of punch in a theme because it's right at the end of a page. And you know what that makes me want to do? See how it pans out for the rest of the story. So the final comment is here uh, for this line, for the final line. It happened. And when it's happened, there is no need to think too hard about it. So I said, this is a very interesting attitude the narrator has and reveals something about her psyche. So she doesn't seem or doesn't want to be perceived as sentimental. Uh, perhaps there's some denial or repelling of emotions being characterized here um, that make me wonder more things about her. Like, is she lonely? She's, she's 70 and I believe she lives with her granddaughter, but it doesn't look like they interact all that much. Um, and for, for me, there's a profound sense of loneliness in this line um, because, of course, this is not fact. It's not a fact that, you know, just because love happened in the past, you know, it's in the past and you don't have to think about it anymore. Like, there's no point in doing that. That's not a fact. That's, that's a positioning that this narrator possesses. And I really want to know why. Uh, why does she think that? Um, it's curious and it makes me definitely want to finish the story, which I did. And I've reread this story a lot because of just how subtly and gorgeously character psychology is revealed in the most unassuming of lines and the most unassuming of ways. But it's also not a puzzle. It, it's a delicate balance between, um, subtle sort of painting in the lines and also clarity. And I think that's really tough to do. So I commend Sue Van Kamtamavangsa for doing that and for writing my favorite short story. So that is the first episode of Story Scoop. So let me know what you thought of this kind of analytical work on other people's work. I was thinking I could do this even for some of my published work, but you know, I don't usually think about my writing, so you know. Um, let me know what actually you want to see covered. Do you want to see novel openings? Do you want to see dialogue? Let me know the kind of craft stuff that you want me to consider. Description, uh, narrative summary, things like that. Just let me know what you want to see in a new episode. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed this. Reminder, if you liked how I analyze these stories and you would like me to edit your stories uh, kind of like this and give comments sort of like this, <laughs> um, I will leave uh, the link in the description for how you could do that for a pay what you can donation, but no pressure. So yeah, that is going to be the end of story scoop number one and I will see you guys in another one. Bye.